Welcome back to Movie Mo Show. Today we are going to preview the apocalyptic thriller film Aftermath. If you like our content, don't forget to like and subscribe. We post multiple times daily. Spoilers ahead. Hunter C. J. Thomason first encounters Jennifer and her younger brother Satchel while on a highway in the opening scene of the movie. As they wait, they see multiple mushroom clouds decimate neighboring targets. By staring at a nuclear explosion directly, Satchel becomes blind. The explosions produce an electromagnetic pulse that renders Jennifer's automobile inoperable. They look for and find an old diesel car that is not affected by the EMP, and they comb local shops for supplies. Elizabeth, Monica Kina, who they meet and join, informs them she observed explosions over several significant cities within viewing range. According to reports on car radios, both the East and West Coast's major cities have been destroyed. Hunter is shot by a scared child while attempting to seek refuge in a nearby house. They can't assist the child, so they leave right away. They discover another farmhouse nearby that they originally believe is deserted. Brad, Edward Furlong, and Jonathan, Ross Brits, interrupt Hunter's gang as they try to enter. Hunter disarms Brad as he attempts to drive them away as he is holding them at gunpoint. Jonathan, whose grandparents own the home, consents to let Hunter and his group to join the other three survivors, Brad, Brad's expectant wife Angie, and his diabetic uncle Wendell, who are already there. Hunter gathers the survivors and tells them to place all of their supplies in the cellar and make an effort to seal it off from the approaching radioactive fallout. He finds a tiny bottle of medicines in the bathroom medicine cabinet and attends to his own bullet wound. Hunter and Jonathan barricade the cellar door and lock themselves inside after storing all of their supplies inside. Hunter informs the survivors that in order to avoid the worst consequences of the fallout, they must stay in the cellar for at least a month. A Geiger counter that Hunter discovers reveals that the radiation level is already significantly greater than anticipated. The devices Jonathan had previously kept in a metal safe, a radio and an MP3 player, are eventually retrieved over the following few days. While Jonathan is concentrating on repairing the shortwave radio, the survivors learn that nuclear bombs have destroyed most of Europe and other places. They can start communicating with other survivors in bunkers around the United States after they fix the microphone. A few days later, Rob, Andre Royo, Jonathan's friend, joins them. Rob is unintentionally shot while attempting to enter the basement. He gets radiation burns and the early symptoms of radiation poisoning from spending more time outside. Jonathan, grieving over accidentally killing his comrade, welcomes him into their refuge after he recovers from his gunshot wound. All of the survivors start to lose strength from radiation exposure despite their measures. Wendell, Jonathan's uncle, passes away first due to diabetic complications. The survivors repel an assault from desperate survivors who are frail from over two weeks of radiation exposure while burying Wendell. Angie loses her pregnancy, bleeds to death, and dies after becoming weak from radiation poisoning-related vomiting. As he watches his wife and child perish, Brad pulls out his revolver and snatches Satchel, threatening to shoot him if Hunter doesn't help Angie. Jonathan knocks Brad down with a shovel before binding his hands to keep him in check. The survivors discover there won't be any assistance after losing communication with the survivors in the other bunker and hearing the attack that engulfs them. Due to the radiation seeping into the cellar, Hunter notices that the others are gradually vanishing. When Satchel gets pneumonia, the survivors are powerless to stop him from getting sicker and eventually dying. Hunter feels terrible shame, accusing himself of treating his own wound with their few drugs. Rob takes Satchel's body outdoors to be buried after accepting the unavoidable outcome. He tells Hunter that the survivors inside will need the rifle more, so he declines to take it. After accepting his loss, Brad apologizes to Hunter and is released from his restrictions. Elizabeth, Jennifer, and Jonathan spend the majority of the following two days resting since they are so weak from radiation sickness and are starting to lose their hair. Brad and Hunter, both of whom are balding, sit and observe the activity upstairs. Brad is instructed by Hunter to let the others sleep because they will need their energy to fend off the impending assault. Both of them acknowledge that Rob, who has been outside for two days, won't be returning. After the initial wave of attackers is beaten back, Hunter leads them outdoors after realizing they are defenseless and confined inside the basement. Now, upstairs, one of the intruders stabs Elizabeth, who is then killed in Hunter's arms. Hunter rushes outside with Brad and attacks the person who killed Elizabeth after becoming furious about her death. Brad is slain during the melee, shielding Hunter from the assailant, who later perishes after being stabbed by Hunter on his own blade. 
Hunter stumbles back inside and discovers Jonathan holding a gun to himself before turning the weapon. Hunter and Jennifer stumble upstairs and huddle up in a bed to sleep because their basement is now contaminated. A few weeks after that, the movie finishes. The only two people still alive are Hunter and Jennifer, who are suffering from radiation sickness and are consuming tainted water from a pump in the yard. Rob's body sits nearby, leaning against a tree. It appears that he managed to bury Satchel but decided against going back to the basement before succumbing to the radiation. Thank you for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe.